everyone and welcome to the MCR conference this year. Um, thanks to everyone who signed up to give a talk. Um, it'll be nice to see everyone and what their work they've been given this uh, doing this year and hopefully it'll be a nice celebration for everyone handing in their dissertations and presentations for the this year. So. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a celebration of everyone's achievements over the past year, so make sure to cheer everyone on once they're done speaking, and then once everyone's done speaking, we'll have time for questions, so anyone in the audience, or even on the live stream if you want to, someone will go check, <laughs> um, and we can ask questions from there. Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll always be giving chance to ask questions at the end, and then we'll have some breaks, so it's not just full on straight through. Um, so the first talk, it will be given by the VSS. Um, and it will be given on um, irrationality and transcendence. So we'll give a round of applause to start off. So hi everyone. Um, my uh, talk is called Unraveling the Unseen, Exploring Irrationality and Transcendence in Mathematics. So often when like people are studying mathematics before, they think of like numbers. It can often be categorized in this setting. So you always start with the natural numbers, so that's any like whole number greater than zero, so like one, two, three. And then you have the integers, so that's any like any whole number, could be positive, negative, so that also includes minus one, minus two. So you see that the naturals are inside the integers. And then the rationals is any number which can be put in the form of a fraction. So again, these are all inside, uh, like integers and naturals again inside the rationals. And then the reals combine all of these together, so like any number. But obviously my talk is on irrationality and transcendence, so you might be thinking, where does like irrational numbers and transcendental numbers fit into this? But when you actually think of the real numbers, they look a bit more like this. You have a new field called the real algebraic numbers. I'll come back to them later to actually explain what they are. But we'll see that the irrational numbers fit into here and transcendental numbers fit into here. So an irrational number is basically any number that can't be put in a form of a fraction. Um, <laughs> so this has actually been known for a very long time. This is obviously Pythagoras. I think if you've gone to school, obviously you should know Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem, it's probably the most famous thing. Anyway, so one of his students one day was looking at some numbers and trying to work out like different numbers you can put together to get this equation. And he put in one plus one squared equals two. Then he thought, what's the square root of two? And he thought about it and realized you can't put root two in the form of a fraction. So in revealing to Pythagoras that not all numbers can be put in the form of fractions, Pythagoras reacted so badly that he responded by taking the student to the river and drowning him. Yeah. <laughs> Other um, research at the time suggests that the guy was actually killed by the gods for coming up with an idea so hideous. Um, <laughs> obviously, in more modern times, mathematicians do not react this badly to uh, new mathematical discoveries. Um, so an area to look at when considering um, irrationality is how can you prove that a number is irrational? There's a number of ways that you can do this. Um, a way I've looked at in particular is by a mathematician called Hermit, and his relies on the fundamental theorem that there are no integers between 0 and 1, which is pretty obvious when you think about it, because, as I've said, it's a whole number, so it can't be 0 or 1. But um, it's a fundamental point that you have to make when proving it. So the way it works with Hermit's method is that you, like, it's called a proof by contradiction. So you start by stating this number you're proving is rational, is in fact rational, so you put it in form of a fraction, and then you construct an integer involving your rational number. And then using this integer, you perform a series of integrations. And by doing this, you get a number and you can show that it's between 0 and 1. And so it cannot be an integer giving you a uh, contradiction. So your number must be rational. So I have a little example of it. So let's say that pi is a rational number. So you can put in the form a over b. So then we construct a number fx is equal to x to the n a minus bx of n of n factorial. Um, n factorial means all the numbers up to n multiplied together. So 3 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3, so 6. Um, so then what you do is you perform integration n times. Sorry, I realise this might be a bit of fun, like everyone's like, well, just try and keep with me. <laughs> um, yeah, so you have to perform integration a series of times until you eventually get to these two functions. And these are like the derivatives of all that. Um, I, I promise this is the most computational heavy side. After this, it gets not as bad. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so then, basically, say so between the numbers you set in between zero and pi, you show that f x sine x um, is greater than zero, and that also with this number that you've constructed, that the, um, this is actually less than one. And in doing so, what we've just shown 
it's like, oh god, one back aside. <laughs> yeah, um, it's between zero and one, and we reach the contradiction, and so pi must be irrational. Um, sorry if that was a bit too computational heavy for everyone. <laughs> um, so then another thing you can look at with um, looking at irrational numbers is how can you approximate an irrational number? Um, so I'll go back to my favourite one, square root of two. Uh, hopefully no one drowns me for mentioning this number. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd do an example. We'll go old school, look at a simple number line. So if you think about the square root of two, where would it fit in? So it would be about here. And we can like zoom in even further. Um, so we can then look at like between these numbers and we see it's about there. And we can keep zooming in again. And again. <laughs> um, until you eventually see, like, you can keep going for a very long time. The idea being is that you can actually approximate an irrational number to quite a high degree. Like, you can keep going. Like, there's infinitely many rational numbers in between here. Like, these lines are the exact same length, but you can keep going and get really, really, really close to it being equal to square root of 2 without actually being the square root of 2. Um, and so that's when mathematicians came up with certain theorems to show how you can show a number is irrational using this way. So one is by a guy called Dirichlet. So he said, for any irrational number, there are infinitely many um, fractions such that the denominator is squared. And this is called the approximation exponent is equal to two. So for a rational number, there's only a finite number of fractions that will give you this. Whereas for a, an irrational one, there's always going to be an infinite number that will give you that number. And then about 20 years later after Hurwitz, uh, after Dirichlet, a guy called Hurwitz came along and provide the best possible approximation to Dirichlet um, and put it in the form of this. And so this is obviously an even smaller number than that. So that's kind of how that works. And you can use this to prove that a number is um, irrational. And then another way that we can look at these numbers is there's a thing called a continued fraction. Um, so these are kind of looks like this. And then, so you can construct um, any rational number into the form of a finite continued fraction. So this is a, a form of a finite one. If you see, written in this form, how it works is, it's just these numbers written there. So it's sometimes neater, need to, like, especially if you're writing out loads of equations, just to write that, than having to write that out again, because believe me, writing that out on latex is tiresome and long. <laughs> um, so then you can also show that you can find an infinite continued fraction, which is unique for any irrational number. So um, in that case, this just keeps going and going and going. And so people like... I think a mathematician called Lindemann proved that um, E was an irrational number by finding it in terms of an infinite continued fraction. Um, and then you can also use this to prove the rational approximation theorems we saw on the last slide. Um, to explain it, so I've got a little example. So if we look at a nice number like 13 over 5, you can put it as 2 plus 3 over 5, and you can rewrite that again as 2 plus 1 over... Because literally, that's just, like, when you put it over something, it just flips it. Um, so then you can split that fraction up again into the form of that, and you can repeat what we just did until you eventually get that. So that is what a continued fraction looks like. Um, there's others you can do for 13 over 5, but this is just one example of like how that works. Um, and so now, this is probably my, ne my next bit is probably my, my favourite bit that I've studied in this topic. It's probably the most difficult bit, but I'll do my best to like, make it simple. It's about the de zeta function, the Riemann zeta function. So this is the Riemann zeta function. So it's a sum of all numbers over 1 to the, um, n to the s. So the s value changes depending on which um, function you're looking at. So that's kind of what it looks like in the general sense. So um, it's, been, it's kind of been known that these are irrational. But you can't, in mathematics, you can't just say, yeah, that number's irrational. You have to have like, physical proof before you can actually claim anything. So it wasn't until 1978 where a guy called Apare came along and proved that zeta 3 was rational, so that's why zeta 3 is often called Apare's constant. So his method um, relied on computing, like creating this sequence. Um, so it's called a recursion sequence if like the a n depends on the number for it, so the n minus 1 term. So basically what this shows is that lim the limit as n goes to infinity of this fraction will equal, equal to zeta 3. And then he uses the Dirichlet theorem that we saw earlier on to prove that that's irrational. Well, this was a very complicated theorem, barely anyone understood it. Uh, and then about a year later, a master student actually came along called um, Bucher, and he managed to prove that zeta 3 was irrational in a much simpler way. He found uh, you could put it in the form of an integral, this one, and then like how we did Hermit proved that our numbers were irrational, you do something similar like that. Um, and
and in a much fewer steps prove that zeta 3 was irrational. Um, and using the same way, he also got zeta 2 was irrational. So seeing this, I thought I'd um, have my own go at trying to prove that zeta 5 was irrational. So that was zeta 5. Um, as of yet, no one has actually um, successfully concluded that it is an irrational number. So in my um, be, being a bit of a vain self, I thought maybe I could have a crack at it, you know. Over a hundred years of mathematicians trying, why not me? <laughs> so I started with Apare's attempt to form a recursion sequence like he did and mimic his method. Um, so in his sequence, the B values, it's always been shown that the B values are an integer for infinitely number of sequences you go up to. Um, I got as far as um, three. I went B0, B1, B2 are all integers. After that, I haven't got quite any further. So <laughs> failed there with Apare's. So I thought, okay, we'll look at Buchan's method. Um, so then I had to try and compute an integral that would be equal to zeta 5. So this is the integral. It's a lot more disgusting than the one for zeta 3. And in doing so, it is incredibly hard. I spent about three days in the maths building just writing out equations, looking a bit crazy. Adam can contest. He was there. He was seeing me doing this stuff. It does um, not work. So I had to go from that. So my final attempt was I decided to see if I could find a continued fraction. And obviously, if I find a final continued fraction, then the zeta 5 must be rational. But if I can't, then surely it must be irrational. So I spent a long time, a lot of like, trial and error, basically, just trying out terms, seeing where I could go um, to get, um, like, see if I could get something with it. And I got, I think, up to like 10 or 15 terms, and then I had to give up because other parts of my disks are actually required, not just this part. <laughs> um, but my percentage error away from that is that. So it's in, in very, very small, but it's not enough to actually conclude whether or not zeta 5 is rational or irrational. Um, so I have to put that on hold for the time being. Um, yeah. So then we can move on from this and look into transcendental numbers. So we've covered this part, and now we look at these ones, the transcendentals. So I'm saying this word, and you're probably like, Olivia, no one knows what this means. I don't know what, I like, don't know, have no clue what transcendentals are about. So here's a definition. So an algebraic number is any number which is a solution to a polynomial. So if you look at like x squared minus 1 equals 0, 1 is a solution, so 1 is algebraic. Similarly, root 2 is also algebraic because it's the solution to x squared minus 2. So just because the numbers are rational doesn't necessarily mean that it will be transcendental. So then a transcendental number is a number which isn't the solution to any polynomial. So pi, for example, is a number which isn't um, the solution to any polynomial. Like, yeah. Um, so then I go on to look at uh, proving the existence of transcendental numbers. Um, so this guy Louisville came along and he thought, ah, oh, I want to prove that E is a transcendental number. He ultimately failed. Um, what he did find, however, was that a, he created his own class of numbers which are transcendental, the Louisville numbers. So it's any which satisfies this inequality. Um, and his most famous one is his constant, which is this one. Um, so while he was not actually able to prove like one thing was transcendental, he was able to prove the existence of others, which is quite cool. But about 30 years after him, a guy called Cantor came along and using countability of sets effectively proved the existence. So the set of real numbers is uncountable. So it's kind of like what you think. Unco uncountable means you literally can't like compute like everything in the set. Um, and so in the real numbers, there's algebraic and transcendental. So he saw that the set of algebraic numbers is countable, so then there must be something which is uncountable, so that's the transcendental numbers. So it's actually not that complicated of a thing to understand when you think of how, like, the, which is hard when you think of like, the topic as a whole, but it's not that easy. Um, and like with the rationality, we can also look into ways to prove that um, numbers are transcendental. So Hermit again, it was literally the same way as he did for um, irrationality, but with a few more steps. Um, but in 1873, he proved that E and pi were transcendental. And then this guy called Lindemann came along, and he, this was his most famous error, is that if you have R, a non-zero algebraic number, then E to the R is transcendental. And this is, like, obviously they look similar, but this is a world of difference having E to the R compared to E, because that opens you up to, like, so many other things, because then you can introduce, like, showing that, like, sine is, like, transcendental, cos and all that. And using it, you can also prove that pi is transcendental, which I'll now show. So if you let i pi be an algebraic number, i um, is an imaginary number, but we won't really go into that. Just like, it, it, just for the time being, just imagine it is an algebraic number, and we're also assuming that in this case, pi is an algebraic number. 
So we apply Euler's identity, which is this, e to the pi, I, e times i to the pi, yeah, something like that, <laughs> is equal to minus 1. Um, but in doing so, you see that minus 1 is algebraic, so i pi must be um, transcendental, so like the reverse kind of what that's saying. And the only way that is possibly <coughs> transcendental is if um, pi is transcendental. Um, yeah. And so I've got like one last thing um, to show you, and then I'm done. You'll have to hear about maths for a little while longer, maybe not another hour, so Adam's over. Um, Adam's talk, but here we go. Um, there are these things called um, the Greek problems. So these are 2,000 year old problems that it wasn't up until I think the 1800s that anyone was able to prove that this, these are not possibly, like you can't actually do them in any way. Um, the reason being was that they were using like methods by Euclid, who's another like famous Greek mathematician, and he was showing that, um, he was trying to do it by simple like ruler and compass construction. So the three um, main problems are doubling the cube. So if you start with a simple cube, can you find one exactly double its size? Um, and what we see is that for that to work, you'd require x cubed to equal 2. Um, and then obviously x, the answer to that would be you need an x equal cube root 2. But that as cube root 2 is irrational, as we showed earlier on, because you can show, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it can't be possible. There's a few more steps to it, but that's like the most simplified version of it. And it she took like a long time to show that. The next one is trisecting the angle. So if you start with an angle, say like 60 degrees, is it possible to then split that into three and all three parts be like equal to each other? And again, it's not possible because you apply, um, you may remember from GCSE maths, the double angle formula. Well, there's actually something called the triple angle formula, which is a lot more disgusting. If I'm being honest, I actually had to hear about this the other day. I didn't even know it existed um, <laughs> when I was like proving these. Um, and what you get is you get an equation like this, and you can show that for any um, num like this will only work when there's an actual like solution. Like most of the time, you will not get numbers that work for that, and so it's not possible to fully really trisect the angle. And then this is probably my favourite one: um, is squaring the circle. It's where you've got to find a circle of equal area um, to that of a square. So it's kind of like seeing how they're meant to be put together. So what you require is, if you say the radius of a um, circle is 1 and the length of the square is x. Well, if you remember GCSE maths, then obviously the area of a square is going to be x times x, that's x squared. And the area of the circle is pi r squared, which is in this case 1. So you get x squared equals to pi. And uh, so then your answer would be x equals root pi. But as you can sh we showed earlier, pi is transcendental. so that is impossible. Um, so yes, that's how you prove the Greek problems. Um, yeah, so that's my presentation done. I'm very sorry if that was too maths heavy for everyone. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Could you go over the trisecting the angle thing again? Sure. Because I think I've ever been over my head a bit. Okay, um, which part? You got everything else. Um, like, so you can't split an angle into three? Yeah. So, so what if you got 60 degrees? You can't. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> He's an insulting yeah. now. It doesn't work like that, um, because when you put in the numbers, um, okay, go ahead and put off the top of my head, because I actually did this the other day. So, um, cos of 60 is equal to a half, um, and in this case, you say that cos theta over 3 is equal to x. So you get a half equals to 4x cubed minus 3x. So you put that in and you get 8x cubed minus 6x equals to 0. No, equal to 1. Yeah. So, it's, so what you get is 1 equals 8x cubed minus 6x. And there's no number that will solve that. Um, so that's how it works. Like, I know it, like, because as as I was thinking myself when I first saw it, like, even Adam said, like, surely, like, you can split an angle. Like, you can, like, yeah. But, um, no, it doesn't really work like that. Um, so... That I, to actually under, go into more depth with this, one requires a lot of Galois theory, which might go from everyone's heads here, so it's not very easy to explain in like limited words. But basically the idea behind this is that another way you can prove rationality is if it doesn't have, if it's similar to kind of like transcendence, it's like, um, in transcendental, like proving a number's algebraic, it's a solution to a polynomial, but like it can be put in the form of like a fraction. Whereas for this one, I believe that the it has to be a solution which is like, 
this is just an integer, I think that's it, um, off the top of my head, but yeah, so that's why it doesn't always work. There are some cases, but most of the time you can't, like that's the probably the most likely if you want. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, cute. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, so what you were realistically saying is that no circle has a area that is not irrational. Because if it was irrational, if it was not irrational, then you could fit a square into it. But um, kind of my question is: is what, why is the case that no area of a circle has? Why is it always irrational? Could you? Do you, do you know why, or are you just basing it off the, that we've got this pi involved when we're calculating? The well, it has to, like, the area of a circle involves pi. I know, but why? Well, I assume this is more fundamental question of why the area of a circle involves pi. Yeah, well, that actually goes back to the Greeks and them, like, trying to calculate, like, um, like, like the, uh, like, circumference of things. So they got a close thing, they were, like, 3.1 or something. Um, but obviously, we like a bit more than that. Um, I mean, there might be a very distant case where um, you can't get exactly right in terms of the rationality of transcendence, but I think in the general case, because the idea is these come from simple, um, they're called ruler and compass constructions, so they come from the rules that between like between any two lines there's an angle, you can let any line go on forever, and... Oh God, what's that like, it's like things like that, like very simple things. Yeah. Like the early stage of geometry, you learn like year three. And so that's all they tried to prove back in the Greek period. Um, instead of, of that, and it took to like, like the invention of like Galois theory to basically realize that, you ha that it doesn't work. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Now, uh, so when you're trying to estimate your zeta phi, mm. so you were going on the approach where you're saying that it's you were trying to find that show that it was rational mm -hmm. because I'm assuming that it's kind of accepted now that zeta five is irrational even though there's no proof to yeah. it. Um, but were you looking for a proof to say how it was irrational or were you just going for that it was rational by trying to find a function to this function that approximates it? Were you trying, how would you, you use that to show that it was irrational or were you just trying to show it was rational? So go back to go back to go back to the size. Well, you have the um, well, you have that ten times ten to the minus seven. Yeah, here. yeah. You had this error really close. Yeah. So were you going to say that it was irrational? Is it in terms of like it's so irrational that okay, we haven't proved it, but I can show to the t ten to the minus seven. I was just. Um, you weren't going for a proof to say that zeta five. Because that was never proved, so even if you get a near perfect function for it, you're still going to have some small percentage error, so it wouldn't be an actual proof yeah. for it. So, was it just to, unless it is rational and thin? Yeah. Much, yeah. So, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, but you were trying to show that it was rational in a sense, but saying, I can get really, really close, so um, it's, it's very likely that it's irrational. Kind of, that's yeah, that's thinking. what I was trying to do. Um, and then once I'd done my own research, so I went to have my own attempt without being kind of like influenced by what other people have been doing online, because there is a lot of people like have attempted to prove zeta five. Um, there's been some quite funny like papers. There's one called like how to not prove that zeta five is irrational, and they had like three different methods, and they did actually attempt to get a continued fraction. Theirs is slightly different from mine because these type of continued fractions are called simple ones because if you see on top of every fraction, it has one on top. Whereas they have like more complex ones where you don't necessarily have one as your numerator on top of each one. Um, so theirs is a lot bigger numbers, but they also got quite close. Um, but yeah, I think they were also trying to show similarly about like how if you could use a continued fraction, would you be able to like either like say if it's a, if you get it by like they're great, you have z to five, or if it doesn't, like it might be irrational. But obviously like the way I've done it isn't enough yet to conclude it. it's either way because it's a bit just like presumptuous almost to be like I haven't found a, an exact continued fraction into a z5 so I'm right so clearly z5 is irrational okay yeah 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 I'm um, like what happens in the world if we prove that z5 is irrational <laughs> 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 <What happens>? um, <laughs> 
it's like Oppenheimer 2.0. No. <laughs> um, it's not that dramatic of a, a, a change, to be honest, if anything, um, if anything happens. I, I mean, it will help um, mathematicians with other things because like, there's been a lot of work to prove that zeta 5 is irrational. In the real world, in like, everyday society, it won't cause much difference, but in the field of maths, especially number theory, which is like my favorite area, it probably would like have a bit of an impact because then it could probably, if they find a successful proof of zeta five, they can probably expand it to a lot of the other numbers. Because so far, I think it's only two, three, and the even ones they've successfully proven are. Um, well, they've actually shown that um, two, like most odd ones, are irrational, but they haven't been able to show for specific values. So. Yeah, I think it'd be helpful for them to actually show for specific values that a number is irrational. Okay, uh, moving swiftly on, that's a very good presentation on the transcendence and rationality. Uh, now we're going to move on to Rowan um, with the civic tribune within Northern Ireland, so everyone. <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, but I'm going to give you a bit of a break now by talking about the Northern Irish conflict. <laughs> I never thought this would be like something that would be less. Uh... Did you want to stop? <laughs> this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, well, hopefully we're getting that up there. Yeah. So I'm going kind to of be talking about the Civic Tribune. Um, <coughs> essentially applying a pre-existing idea about ethnic political parties to um, non-ethnic political parties. Um, so, just moving straight through. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to give you an idea about what I'm going to be talking about. Um, this is a presentation I gave at a political studies association conference in Edge Hill early this year. It's basically a better version of what I presented there. Hopefully. Um, and yeah, so I, I kind of covered four main areas. I'll be discussing the underlying theories around how we have explained political parties and how they compete elections in Northern Ireland, um, how they behave, how they interact, the dynamics of their interactions. Um, and then moving on, I'll talk, talk a bit more on why we're why we actually concerned about civic political parties. Why do we care about parties that fall outside of the ethnic divide? Why are they increasingly more important? Um, and then I'll discuss the Alliance Party, the largest civic party, and their identity as a potential tribune, how they fit in with this kind of mechanism. And then I'll go into a bit more detail about how I intend to test this. And you know, take, taking this forward, once I've finished what I'm doing here, once I've got a bit of spare time, Sundays are finally free again, I might start doing this a bit more, but we'll see. So, into what contestation? Um, for, the, for those who aren't aware about Northern Ireland, it, it's a conflict that's been raging, some would say since 1921, others would say about 700 years earlier, depends who you ask. Um, but the consequence of that is that electoral politics is divided into two distinct blocks. Uh, you have the unionist community and you have the nationalist community. And what interblock contestation essentially asserts is that parties from one community do not seek votes from members of the opposite community. Which means that a unionist party will compete for votes with other unionist parties and nationalist parties will compete for votes amongst other nationalist parties. But they won't try and cross into other people's areas, they won't try, no, you won't see the DUP campaigning much on the fall because it's a Catholic area. And this is essentially what, what intra-box politics seeks to explain. Um, you know, as, as, as a second point there, this kind of turns elections in divided societies like Northern Ireland into headcounts. Uh, they're essentially a rerun of the census every four years where you can kind of, can kind of predict who's going to win based on the demographics, based on the population distribution, based on who lives where and how many people exist. Um, However, we'll go, go on a bit later to explain why that is especially interesting and, and the consequences of that kind of interaction. Um, now, many people look at this and they say, well, this inevitably leads to very emotive, very conflict-driven campaigning. Um, 
you know, it, it, it's been asserted multiple times, this, this idea of ethnic outbidding, where parties try to win power by asserting themselves as the most aggressive, most emotive supporter of the ethnic interests. Basically, the best fight in the ring for the conflict. Um, and the rise of the DP and Sinn Féin, the two more extreme parties on the, the ethnic divide in Northern Ireland, is kind of seen by a lot of people as, as proof of this. It kind of said that, oh well, you know, less than five years after 98, we started to see the very radical DUP, Sinn Féin, the former political ring of the IRA, coming to power. This is clear that we're seeing ethnic outbidding occurring in Northern Ireland. This, this is the situation we have. Um, however, Mitchell, Paul Mitchell and co, asserted that this wasn't the case. Um, because interblock contestation emerged from Sinn Féin and DUP, what we were actually seeing was these parties asserting themselves as the most effective representative of the wider interest. Um, for Mitchell, there was a more of a moderating effect to the ethnic tribune. This, this is the distinction between the outbidding pieces. Um, we can kind of see this pan out in, in the case of who Sinn Féin replaced, for example, who the DUP replaced. They replaced more moderate figures. And they didn't do that because the moderates couldn't keep up. They did that because they edited their platform to encapsulate a lot of what the moderates are saying. So Sinn Féin is now widely regarded as the champions of constitutional nationalism. For those who don't know what constitutional nationalism is, essentially the party platform of the Social Democratic and Labour Party. So we're starting to actually see the more extreme, extreme parties in Northern Ireland co-opt and adopt and moderate their platforms in order to seem as a more effective partner within government. And this is Mitchell's point. Because of power sharing in Northern Ireland, because it creates guaranteed places in government for members of the unionist community and for members of the nationalist community, the question for voters becomes less who can take the fight to the other side best. It becomes who is best able to work with the other side and get the most out of that partnership. So, within that, we can kind of see that the Ethnic Tribune asserts a different behaviour within power sharing. It's one of the reasons why people have said Northern Ireland power sharing system has been so effective, despite the issues of the government, despite the instability at times. It has forced political parties to reckon with their party platform and present themselves as moderate partners in government. And in this sense, there is an internal and an external dimension to what an ethnic tribune is. Um, as we said before, there is this element of outbidding within the community. They look inwards internally to put themselves out as their best partner. But they also have to present themselves externally as someone who can be worked with. And it, this was largely the, uh, the reason why the assembly collapsed in 2017 because of the scandal around Arlene Foster, the leader of the DUP, because of the issues around the DUP's management with instalment, Sinn Féin said that they could no longer work with the DUP as a partner in government, which then led to the collapse of the Assembly. And so we start to see that a lot of these internal and external dimensions are panned out and they're seen within the way parties behave, and by looking at the ethnic tribune theory, we can start to understand how, how we can expect parties to act. So, we've covered the ethnic split, we've covered how ethnic parties behave, we've done it very briefly, whistle stop tour. Um, but the next question is why do we bother about civic parties? Um, this graph is to me fascinating when I first came across it during my undergraduate dissertation. Um, this is one I made myself. Uh, it's taken from the Northern Irish Life and Time Survey, it's a massive survey that's done every year where they canvass people's community backgrounds to canvass their political opinions, draw conclusions from the two. Now what we see is that between 98 and 2018, the number of people who refuse to identify along the ethnic divide increases. See a dip here, 
it dips up and down now and again as political phenomena come and go. But the trend is upwards. I believe again this year it went back up to this similar similar to this 50% figure. When it hit 50% in 2018, every single newspaper had this as either headline or page two news in Northern Ireland. The idea that half of the population of the region no longer felt that they were represented by the dominant ethnic split, a split that has defined the region for almost 100 years, was massive. And this begs the question, are political identities in Northern Ireland as fixed as we are led to believe? Are, are people, you know, born waving Union Jack or born singing rebel songs? Clearly not. Clearly there is some fluidity. Clearly there is some change here. And um, that in turn tells us that we need to understand how this politics works, how this politics outside of the divide functions. Um, which again calls for us to start to consider how civic political parties function, how they engage with each other, how they act. Um, but unfortunately, as Suma makes the case quite clearly, civic political parties are very poorly understood, they're very poorly researched. Um, the, the persistent idea throughout, throughout history has been they don't have a guaranteed place in the government, they don't represent a dominant political grouping, therefore they're not relevant to understanding how party systems function how government functions, how divided society function. More and more, as we start to see graphs like this show up not only in Northern Ireland, but in Bosnia, in Lebanon, across the world, increasingly that position is untenable. And a lot of this work and the work of other people is about challenging this dominant position and giving more attention to civic parties and understanding how they fit. And for our case of Northern Ireland, there's two key parties that we want to talk about. Uh, the first is Alliance. Now Alliance was uh, initially the liberal wing of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, they split from the party in 1970, joined with the New Ulster Movement, which is an anti-sectarian, anti-violent movement, to eventually form what was initially presented as a bi-confessional party, a party that represented Catholics and Protestants equally. Um, you know, with, within that language itself, you can see the parties always tried to step above the round parties, always tried to step past the divide and represent something that they saw as greater than, than the division. Uh, nowadays, that has been secularised into an image of cross-community, as religious identity becomes less salient within Northern Ireland, it's more a case of bringing the two communities together, making a new community, making a new shared society where it doesn't matter what you were, where you came from, how you are. This is your place, this is how you are. Um, since 2019 there's been what's called the Alliance Surge and that was that's essentially when Voters in Northern Ireland started looking to the Alliance as an increasing source of support. Um, as a result, they now sit as the third largest party in Northern Ireland with 17 seats in the Storm Assembly. On the other hand, we have the Green Party. Founded in the 1980s as part of the wider Green movement that spread across Europe. Denuclearization, environment, deforestation, all these issues bundled together to create the Green movement and the Green Party in Northern Ireland likewise emerged from that. Since 2006 they've worked more closely with the, their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland but they've always maintained a non-sectarian mutual position when it comes to aspects of the constitution. Um, they are relatively minor in terms of their influence. I was, we're going to discuss exactly how they lost their two seats because it is quite interesting but they are now no longer have any representation in the Assembly, whereas prior to the 22 election, they held two seats, and they have since lost both. This brings on the question of who do these people represent, and I think this will bring us on to the point of contention as to why we can start to use ethnic tribune 
ethnic tribune theory to describe civic parties. Um, looking again at the Northern Irish Life and Times, this question was, which party do you feel most closest to? And the trend that really does interest me with this is this little purple box here. These are the people who didn't identify with any political party. We can start to see that it increasingly goes up and up and up, right up until here. So we're starting to see a trend over these 20 years of people saying, none of these parties are for me. I don't align with any of their views. I don't align with the, the, their party platforms. I don't vote. 2022, it shrinks. Who takes that place? Alliance Party, Green Party votes. So some, something happened here. Again, the Alliance surge was in 2019. Between those two years, people suddenly, people who weren't aligned with any political party suddenly found a home both in Alliance and in the Green Party. And this is what interests me the most. This kind of phenomena where suddenly we see this drop off in people who no longer felt disenfranchised, no longer felt an apathy towards politics, suddenly felt as if they had someone they could identify with. And the question is, why? Why is that happening? In comparing this to the trends of increasing numbers of people who didn't align with the ethnic divide, who refused to identify as either unionist and nationalist, I think this, this positions us to ask the wider question of why do so many people now look to the civic political parties as their representatives? What has changed and what dynamics are at play? Which led me to consider the Alliance Party as a potential tribune. Um, going back to what we said before about Mitchell's idea, from that I think we can draw out this idea that there's an internal and external dimension. Well, the Alliance have shown this quite clearly. Um, Alliance has entered the, the executive, despite the fact that they don't have a guaranteed place. They almost have a de facto guaranteed place within the Ministry of Justice. This is the ministry that regulates the police force and the courts in Northern Ireland. It's incredibly politically sensitive. Police reform is a key pillar of the peace process. Some people want more, some people think it's gone too far. So for a nationalist, if you put a unionist Protestant in the office, they will feel uncomfortable. Likewise for unions, if you've got nationalists in the job, they will feel uncomfortable. So who comes up? The Alliance Party. The Alliance Party are asked on multiple occasions to take the role of justice because they are seen as a neutral actor, because they don't identify with either community. As well as that, the current leader, Naomi Long, has repeatedly emphasised that she's acted as a mediator. She's betrayed herself as an essential key to making the current flawed power sharing system work. Again, we go, go back to this idea of being an effective partner, being able to be someone who, work, who, who you can work, be worked with. Naomi Long is putting out the narrative that if you want the executive to work, you need alliance in that room, which then leads to more people voting for the party in a tribune sense. Um, turning now to the internal dimension, People that have, you know, people such as Tong and others have increasingly emphasised that the civic issues, these ideas of you know, equal marriage rights, access to abortion, uh, legacy right, rights for vic victims of violence, these, these civic issues that come to the fore in Northern Irish politics, these have increasingly defined the Alliance Party's policy platform. So looking again at who promotes those ethnic interests, who promotes those community block interests, Alliance, we can argue, is portraying itself as the person who will justify those, those actions and who will take them forward and push for them in the Assembly. So, that's kind of why I think Alliance is a tribute. Um, I'll briefly go on now to explaining how I intend to test it. And it does very much swing on the 22 election, which is why I said we, we come back to it now. Um, as you said before, the ethnic tribunes are an aspect of intra block contestation. If there isn't any intra block contestation, there isn't an ethnic tribune. So, therefore, if we want to assert that something is an ethnic tribune, we need to find intra block contestation. 
based on the recent elections, we can develop a hypo hypothesis that there is. Um, I said to you before, the Green Party lost both of their seats in the 22 election. They lost them in the constituencies of South Belfast and North Down. Both of those seats, those fifth seats, were picked up by the Alliance Party. On top of that, we can see the shift in votes in terms of who went down and who went up. It's very hard with Northern Ireland's political system to ascertain directly that someone's votes went directly to another party because it's far more complicated than the one that we use in Great Britain. STV has a ranking preferential system and then votes for your second, third, fourth, fifth candidate are then transferred across. This makes it difficult to ascertain exactly where votes have gone and why parties have won and why parties have lost. However, we can look at the swings. And for the, the first preference votes for the Green Party went down, and the f f uh, first preference votes for the Alliance Party went up. This then leads us to believe that there is a potential for a shift. We then need to test it. It's a the question of how. Um, so going forward, this is what I'm hoping to be able to do once I've got a bit more time on my hands. And it involves looking at the existing data sets very ably produced by Liverpool and Queen's Belfast. They put out some fantastic studies and data sets on political identity and voting behaviour and how people vote across different elections and, and for why. Um, so it's a case of looking at those, seeing how people voted, seeing how people considered each party, how that affected their votes. Um, and this will provide a good foundation from which to judge the hypothesis. It's also something we can take further. Um, in Mitchell's initial work, one of the methods they used was taking a mock ballot that they drew up and they included it in a survey that they gave to so many voters. And they asked them, who did you vote for in the 1996 forum and referendums? And who did you vote for in the 1998 assembly election? And then they judged directly how votes had changed between those two elections to determine, based off of these existing data sets and this existing data on how political identity and perception affects votes, to see how those votes are shifting directly from party to party. It's, it's essentially how they prove that, P, that SCLP voters were preferring Sinn Féin as a better community representative and likewise the UUP and the DUP. So by copying that result, we not only replicate Mitchell's method, we not, can not only update the, the theory as a whole, we can test the, the hypothesis of this research using proven methods. So again, it's about replicating experiment and taking it further to apply to this theory. But of course, just to finish up, why does any of this matter? Um, firstly, a lot has changed since 2016. Brexit changed a lot. The assembly has collapsed twice since Brexit. The European pillar is the unspoken fourth pillar of the peace in Northern Ireland. Um, and really we want to be re-examining the ethnic tribunal. To be honest, we want to be re-examining every single thing that we came up with before 2016 and seeing whether it still fits. Um, so that's the first thing as to why we should be bothering. The second reason if we can assert, if we can prove that civic political parties are acting like ethnic blocks, if that there does exist a civic block within Northern Ireland, this has extreme ramifications for how we interpret politics. This has extreme ramifications for how we portray the ethno-political divide within Northern Ireland. Very suddenly, we start to go from this view here, where the others are just a coalition of people who don't fit who are misshaping jigsaw pieces, to actually viewing them as a solid political block within their own rights within Northern Ireland. And then we can start to ask further questions about, are the institutions designed properly? Are their voices heard effectively? Are they properly involved in community debates and uh, discussions? So really, we can see that this research not only seeks to update a pre-existing theory, it also has the potential to fundamentally change the way that we view politics and identity within Northern Ireland 
and other similar divided societies. Thank you very much. I'm aware I did go over, but if there's time for one or two That's questions. Fine. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, is, is there an age thing? Like, are younger people voting for the civic party because they're not as religious or they're not alive during the conflict? So, very interesting. When we look at the age split, increasingly young voters tend to support nationalist parties. Mm -hmm. Inter very interesting one. Um, there's, there's lots of ideas about that. Um, one of the main ones is the idea that the Irish Catholic population in Northern Ireland is younger. Um, there are more of them, you know. The population dynamics have been showing us that there has been more of an evening out. What was once a unionist specific majority is now becoming more of an even split between the two. So this might be a good reason as to why. Um, is also, there is another theory that they don't remember the violence of those other people. We, we saw violence last year of Protestant young people out in the streets burning out a bus. There is a problem that maybe there are people of voting age who don't remember the horrors, the troubles, who merely repeat the stories that have been heard about the heroes of 1921, and maybe this is why we're starting to see young people vote for the National Party. Um, there is definitely a block of young people who step outside, but in terms of identifying demographic on who that is, it tends to be people who are born of like a mixed marriage, quite a lot. So people who have a Protestant mother, Catholic father, Catholic mother, Protestant father. You know, people who are cast, you know, lost their drift between the two. Um, education is also important. The increase of integrated schools has meant that people are not shown a community focused view of history and they're able to make up their own mind on a lot of these issues. So there are dynamics to it but it's not as clear cut as saying young people are more liberal and progressive than, say, past generations, because that's not always true. Yeah, I just saw a similar question. Like, as the years have gone by, and you know, people have been able to immigrate from their countries, like some one of my friends who lives in Northern Ireland now, and he's like, you know, his background isn't from Northern Ireland. So is it some sort of similar thing as like, you know, as diversity comes in, it's changing a little bit as well? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that is, a small aspect of it. Um, the growing migrant population, the growing um, proportion of people who are others because they're not Northern Irish does play a significant role. Um, the question of course is, will this group ever reach a critical mass in order to affect elections? Very unlikely. Um, it could explain why Alliance is doing so well in places like South Belfast, where there are more you know, middle class immigrant populations. It's the Queen's Quarter where the university is. So this might explain, might be one aspect to it. Um, but in terms of having it as a singular determining factor, um, demographically there, there are other potential reasons why it might be the case. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan, for that talk. Next up, we have Alex. We're going to have one more, and then we're going to have a break. Just give me a second for Laptops work again. There's a stand underneath the laptop. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you for coming to see my talk. Um, my talk's going to be on um, mantle plumes um, surrounding sort of their existence and uh, the role in which they play in the formation of ocean island sea mount chains, in specific the Hawaiian sea mount chain, as you can see here. Um, Where's the arrow? Which arrow? Down. Yeah, this side. <laughs> Is that one? The, the, this one's it, yeah, that's up. Okay, so I'm going to just run through some hypotheses, the main hypotheses um, surrounding the genesis of Ocean Island 
too much chains, mainly the mantle plume theory, um, the main, mainly generally accepted one, and then the main contender against the mantle plume theory. So, mantle plumes are thought to be sort of deep upwellings from within the mantle, so originating from the core mantle boundary, where the mantle is in contact with the core. These really large thermal, thermochemical upwellings of magma within the mantle. The, um, and as they rise, the pressure of these, these um, of the magma um, decreases. So uh, their, their temperature rises and it actually allows for melting to occur. So what you get is um, mater mantle material rising, decreasing in pressure, coming into contact with your lithosphere, um, oceanic crust, creating partially melted material and forming trails of volcanoes. Um, this is um, well, a, a, well, just a volcano initially anyway, or sort of a flood basalt. Uh, and then what they people have hypothesized is a tectonic plate moves over this hotspot, which then creates trails of volcanoes, which m um, can extend for thousands of kilometers across the seafloor. Um, mantle plumes, there have been tens of hypotheses building upon this, taking, taking things from it, leak, completely scratching other things from it. Um, people have hypothesized around pulsings of mantle plumes, but it's not just a continuous upwelling, it's actually several upwellings, um, which create sort of intermittent volcanism. They, they talk about sort of the way in which they can interact with a moving tectonic plate over the top of them. And how the ways in which they can create sort of varying morphologies of ocean, ocean island cha ch chains. Um, then this here is just a sort of a little gif, which sort of shows a really slow moving plate over this hot thermochemical upwelling, creating volcanoes. What is, I think it ends there. It's, it's just a very short one. But what you get afterwards is this continuing to move and more and more volcanoes afterwards. Then here is the main contender for this hypothesis. The plate structure and stresses hypothesis sort of is oriented around how the structure of a tectonic plate, um, whether or not there are cracks, thin parts, um, weaknesses effectively within a plate, an ocean, an ocean plate, which um, either just the mantle itself can exploit or some form of upwelling of it from the mantle. For example, if you have a thin bit of crust, so the man mantle material has to rise to fill the gap of like a thin bit of crust like that. So there is a decrease in pressure from the mantle material moving up there, which can create melting. So, and that will cause and, and can create volcanism and flexure of plates like we've got here. This is from Hieronymus of Berkovici. So this is actually, they've hypothesized that actually the loads of volcanoes on ocean island plates can impact the stresses around it, the stress regimes around, around it. So what, um, and sort of what parts of the plate surrounding it are under stress and can influence where a volcano surrounding it will arise based on the load of that volcano. So those two are the main two hypotheses. That's what you need to remember for now, anyway. Um, I'm going to move on to where I'm looking. I'm looking at the Hawaiian Seamount chain. It's largely considered the, te the perfect example, the textbook example of mantle plumes, ocean island volcanism, and volcanism as a whole. It's volcanologists love it. Um, it's obscenely long, 6,700 kilometers. That's 
longer than the diameter of the Earth, no, radius of the Earth, sorry, um, over 100 volcanoes spanning this, some of which, well, the, at least on Big Island Hawaii, they're um, technically taller than Mount Everest, they're about 12,000 metres from the floor of the sea, um, Mount Ake, that is, anyway. Um, people ha think that there is a linear trend within this seamount chain. They say that volcanoes follow a straight line. They are almost a plane moving over a plane moving over a plume creates a straight line. And potentially the most unique part about this chain is actually that there is a change of direction within this plane. This, this plume, there is a sixty degree bend within the Hawaiian seamount chain. And then even more so, which is another very unique part about it, there's a, um, a dual trend. Um, so people have tested the geochemistries of the rocks produced by these lavas, and there are sort of parallel sets of volcanoes running down the most, the youngest end of our, I'll change this slide real quick. There are parallel sets of volcanoes running down the youngest end of this chain here. And volcanoes on each side of these, these two parallel lines, effectively, have completely different chemistries, even though if it were a mantle plume, they're meant to um, be sort and source the same, made from the same source material. Um, yeah, so, so these images are probably what most people would associate with Hawaii. This is what I associate with Hawaii. Um, <laughs> here you've sort of just got um, this is the Hawaii Never Seen That Chain, all 6,700 kilometers of it. It's bloody massive. Um, Youngest end, right here, and this is your really, really oldest end. And this nice figure up here shows you the history of volcanoes. You've got your young, youngest end here, the active volcanoes, and over time, as your plate moves, these young or massive volcanoes get um, eroded uh, um, by the wind, by rain, um, land, landslides and also the sea, which creates these really, really unique, actually habitats, atolls. And there's this region in and around here, which is, I think, the, one of the only actual um, environments in the world like it. Um, and as a result, George Bush has banned all sort of scientific sampling of rocks. So we don't like George Bush. Um, <laughs> so as for the actual project now, I am going to run through some of the methods of which I've done. I've located, um, so for, for this project anyway. So initially I needed to find out where the volcanoes were. That's potentially the, um, the most important part, potentially the entire thing. So as you can see down here, you've got two different eruption styles. This is Stromboli, that's probably what most people would consider a classical volca volcanic eruption. This is a Hawaiian eruption. It's, there is no center of a volcano. It is a fissure eruption. It is a dead straight line. And Hawaiian volcanoes erupt in lines, not craters. So from this, we can actually figure out where the center of volcanoes is from these lines. These lines are called rift zones. So for example, Kilauea, the youngest volcano in the Hawaiian chain, recently erupted 2018, it's actually erupting currently right now, but one of the more recent eruptions, the, the USGS have mapped the rift, rift zone eru um, eruptions, of, 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 uh, they're effectively dead straight lines which lead straight to the um, volcanic centres. So you can track back to the, the centre of a volcano following these lines of fissures, or these fissure eruptions, these rift zone lines. And this right here is an example of what I've done effectively by, um, I think this is about 2,000 kilometers west of the actual, of, of here. This is a completely submerged portion and it's pretty, actually probably the best example of the entire chain of how you can trace back um, rift zones. I've got, um, so what here, it's just a simple um, slope map. You, the, the darkest colors, the steepest slopes, no color, not really any slope at all. And you can see sort of on a lot these rift zones follow the axis of these um of the ridges effectively of this volcano. 
and from that you can trace back to this little red dot where that is the centre of that volcano. So that's the most important part of this project done. I know where all the volcanoes are. Next is the hard part, it's the, um, the complicated stuff. So what I have been doing, the project is looking at the distributions of volcanoes, whether or not there are any alignments, whether or not there is... The Hawaiian Sea Mount chain is best described by just a single linear line, or whether or not we have segments of lines within the chain. We've used the Huff Transform for this. Um, previous people at Durham, Adam Pacey, has used the Huff Transform at, um, to, to um, detect great circle um, distributions of ocean, um, ocean island arcs. Um, I think that's the Mariana, the Mariana arc. And I've used this exact same method for um, detecting lines within ocean island volcanism, or volcanism, volcanoes. And what we do is we sort of set these big base of volcanoes in it, and it, it identifies potential alignments. So here we have lots of potential alignments, which each of which is designated a quality of fit. Each of one, say, it, it has a misfit of 10 kilometers or along those lines. And from that, I have whittled all of these down and to what are the best fitting lines. From there, well, first I should probably clarify, each line is described by, a but it's drawn by two points, two points being two, vol two volcanoes. Each line is one volcano at each end, one volcano to one volcano. But that's probably not the best way in which it's described. We have to modify these lines because they're not always going to be d dead straight, um, either stress regimes or fractures which could cause this. So what we have um, applied linear transformations to these um, alignments to sort of find the best fitting um, alignments for these alignments, the best fitting alignments for these alignments, um, each of which has been designated a, a, an alright misfit, misfit and has um yeah um so I mentioned that each of these lines represents a great circle. We've um so previous people have des described. Ocean island volcanism as small circles. Small circle is a circle on the on the globe which has a radius less than the Earth's radius, whereas a great circle has a radius of the Earth's radius. So completely circumference around the exact centre. This could be at any orientation; it's still a great circle. Whereas a small circle has a smaller radius. So we have been comparing great circle distributions to the small circle distributions. We've had to use the Akiki information criterion because of differences in parameters. There's, um, a, there's more adjustable parameters in um, small circles than our great circles, so that's to reduce bias in the um, comparisons. Um, we can get to the results now, and this is what we have found. There is actually, I mean, it's a lot easier to see that there's actually there are a very, very clear set of alignments going straight across the entire chain. Initially, you look, could look at it and there would be, you could see maybe just one dead straight line. However, I think it's very clear that it's um, segmented. I think each separate line is, um, has its own sort of azimuth, completely sort of looking independent to each other um, segments. Certain segments are a bit more speculative than others. I think this one is probably my least favourite. I think this is the, the hardest one to potentially constrain. There are um, two volcanoes here. Um, I think they're N Nero and something else, Seamounts, just between and midway, just between the two of them. And it's really odd because, well, at least ocean island volcanism, you expect dead straight line if it's to create from mantle plume. But we've just got a dead straight line, two volcanoes outside of a dead straight line, which, hang on a minute, how does that work? So we have hypothesized that these two volcanoes 
have actually been um, there's been some influence from transform zones actually influencing the formation of where these could be. Um, this is for the other part of the chain. It's so big I have to do two maps. Um, another interesting part. This is about 300 kilometers between the two <coughs> volcanoes. There's been a 300 kilometer pause in volcanism in at Hawaii. How can a mantle plume explain that? Or solely mantle plume explain that? This is probably the most complicated part of the chain to describe. The bend, as I mentioned earlier. Um, there's lots of arguments about the bend. It's very, very controversial. Um, I'll leave it at that. And another very interesting part. So I don't have it mapped down, but there is a fracture zone running just like this, sort of multiple fracture zones coming along here. And all of these volcanoes here align perfectly with the alignment or direction of those fracture zones. So the plate structure must be influencing volcanism somehow. So now we're looking at potential causes of the segmentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, could the segmentation be caused by the pulsing of a mantle plume? Could a mantle plume be pulsing up um, magma and that cause sort of changes in the way or changes in what we see on the Earth? Could um, halo tectonic features, um, ancient features, fractures within the Earth, like I just mentioned, the Shats Shatsky right, fracture zone? So, paleo tectonic refers to ancient, ancient features within the Earth, which could affect these paleo tectonic features affecting these. So if they, these alignments follow, maybe even just a dead straight fracture within the, the, the ocean crust. Could deformation or the failure of a mantle plume cause them? Could um, a mantle plume not being dead straight, could it be getting pulled to a side and that being influencing where it is? Could the conduit be not even completely vertical? Could it actually be wandering? Could that influence the segmentation? Or could neo-tectonic events, could current tectonic processes be influencing where we see volcanism in Hawaii currently? Could what we see in the Philippine plate, could that have an influence on what we see in the um, Hawaiian Empire map chain. So, so what we've done, this is, um, I hope this works, I really hope this works. So what we've been doing, oh there we go, plate reconstructions, we've been looking at plate reconstructions. The number is that how, however many million of years ago it is. And what this is doing is showing you how the plates have moved throughout the years. And you can watch certain parts as, I don't know, subduction zones, the red lines, I just appear, they could disappear, some arise. The Mariana Trench here deforms massively. Oh, that, that's spoilers. Um, the Mariana Trench deforms massively between five and um, present. Um, other some, um, spreading ridges just form. Um, there's lots of tectonic events occurring within the um, West Pacific and Southeast Asia. It's ridiculously complex, this area. I, I don't even want to try and fully understand it. But there's lots of stuff happening here which could affect it. And there's also lots of stuff happening on the east of the Pacific. I don't have plate reconstructions for that, I'm sorry. But you're looking at these plate reconstructions, this is what we found. So each box represents the age ranges, radiometric ages for volcanoes. Um, a volcano, so each segment is a range. That segment, one, two, three, four, five, so on. Each segment has an age range. These crosses, bars, represent tectonic processes. It could be a subduction zone forming, it could be a subduction zone stopping completely. It could be a new plate forming. Um, the complete disappearance of a plate, of two plates fusing together. 
And what we can see is actually we get clusters of periods. For example, here, at about 25 million years ago, um, years ago um, where um, some tectonic processes within the um, East, um, West Pacific happen. Most interestingly, this, these orange lines, this is the formation of the Cocos and Nazca plates. They formed through three separate spreading, um, three separate spreading events. The first spreading event, and then a second mid-ocean ridge spreading centre spanned off from that, and then a third one spanned. So, and funnily enough, they converge perfectly with where um, some of these um, alignments occur. Um, this is not all of them, I've just hand-picked a few, but um, yeah, in conclusion, I think, well, it's a very, very complicated thing to explain, and it's also very, very controversial to just say, I don't think there is a mantle plume. I do think there is a mantle plume. I think there is lots of evidence, geochemical anyway, which points towards a mantle plume influencing the um, creation of volcanism. I think a mantle plume could influence the large scale distribution of volcanism. However, I think near tectonic events, tectonic events like I showed you in the, the plate constructions, can affect stress regimes within, within the centre of the um, Pacific plate. And that is the cause of what we see in, or, or is the driving factor in the segmentation of the Hawaiian steel chain. Go on. Ask the geology one. So it might be easy if you go back to the map where you've drawn out the lines. Oh, maybe back, yeah. Um, have you got it? Okay. I hate map. <laughs> Which one? Um, <laughs> Which map? Kind of the one on the first bit of the trail. Oh. Yeah, so you see there's the two parallel lines for Kilauea. Yeah. The newer one. And then they're all just straight lines. Yeah. Do they know why they've suddenly it became two different magmas chemistry. Like, I didn't actually know that they had, that it had stopped, that it so wasn't parallel. So people don't really know. Yeah. And it's highly, highly debated. Um, some people think that a mantle plume could have passed over something like um, an LS, LLSVP, mm -hmm. sort of a uh, heterogeneity within the mantle, and it could be something Just something which isn't a normal man mantle composition. And actually, you've got a conduit, which is a normal composition and it's actually just in training just a little bit here so actually half of it's what it normally is and it's actually getting another little bit which is different on the other side mm -hmm. so it's actually sort of like mantle plume could just be like that and it's actually just split the two chemistries of mantle plume like that and two halves of mantle plume could be it mm -hmm. it's very very um difficult to actually tell um because ultimately you have no way of actually <laughs> getting there um but that's the best guess people have had so far at why there are two chemistries. Any more questions? Okay, uh, we'll just have about five minutes and then we'll go to the next talk. Five or ten minutes. <laughs> next up we have um, you were giving us a history book. <laughs> right, so I'll be um, talking about uh, the dissertation which I researched this year. So my dissertation title is The Best Pocket of No Party, um, African Americans and the 1948 American Presidential Election. So this is a quote from, uh, this is a quote from uh, Henry Lee Moon, who was a uh, African American analyst. Um, and then um, in his 1948 book, which was called The Balance of Power, um, he argued that the uh, African-American vote was in the best pocket of no party, so it had to be earned. Um, so put simply, my dissertation um, examines the role played by African-Americans in the 1948 election. So the influence of 
this group in this election has been largely underemphasized and sometimes completely overlooked. Um, so therefore, contrary to much of the existing uh, historiography, my dissertation um, aims to demonstrate that African Americans were responsible for Harry Truman's victory in 1948. Um, so the image on this slide shows the rather famous picture of Truman um, holding the uh, prematurely printed uh, Chicago Tribune headline, which was, um, it said, uh, Dewey defeats Truman. So <coughs> this newspaper, like much of the United States, um, was convinced that Truman was destined to lose the election. Um, there's therefore been much discussion about how Truman won an election that he seemed certain to lose. Um, and my dissertation um, aims to you know, contribute to the solving of this problem. Uh, and I'll just outline the agenda uh, for this presentation. So first I'll give some background to the election itself um, and explain why I chose to examine the influence of African-American voters uh, specifically. Um, then I'll outline the two main uh, debates um, that my dissertation contributes to. Um, after that, I'll then outline my argument and then offer some examples of the primary sources that I used uh, to make that argument. Uh, I'll then end with a you know, brief conclusion that will uh, summarise the points uh, that I've made. I'll now just give a bit of background to the election itself to just give some uh, you know, uh, context. So Harry Truman was running for the uh, Democratic Party. Um, the picture on this slide, it shows Truman with his uh, running mate who was um, Alvin Barkley. So Truman convincingly uh, won the uh, Electoral College, um, so he secured 303 votes. Um, he therefore beat Thomas Dewey, who was the uh, Republican Party's candidate, who won only 189 um, Electoral College votes. But the uh, popular vote was much closer, so Truman won 49.6%, while Dewey received 45.1%. Um, Truman therefore only uh, outpolled Dewey by 2 million votes, um, with the margin of victory being so narrow, um, this election can be used to understand the uh, influence of individual um, voting groups. Um, the 1948 election also, it wasn't just like a simple two-party race, um, because there were two major um, third-party candidates. These were uh, Henry Wallace, um, who you can see on this slide, um, who represented the uh, Progressive Party, and also Strom Thurmond, um, who ran for the uh, States' Rights Democratic Party, which um, is just simply shortened to uh, a Dixie Crap. Um, and both candidates performed rather poorly. Um, Wallace did not win any Electoral College votes and only received 1.1 million votes in total. Um, which was just 2.4% of the popular vote. Um, Furman did a bit better. He won four states in the South, uh, which amounted to 39 um, electoral votes. Um, so um, during the Second World War, um, hundreds of thousands of African Americans migrated from the South to the North of the United States in search of employment. Um, in just the 1940s, um, over 2 million African Americans migrated northwards, uh, which doubled their number in this region. Um, so due to this um, great migration, um, as it's called, um, the uh, African American electorate increased by roughly 80% between 1940 and 1948. So with so many more African Americans now enfranchised, the 1948 election can be used to determine how influential this group was. Uh, I now outline the uh, main debates that I engaged with in my presentation. Uh, so there are two main debates that I contributed to, um, and a chapter on the 1948 election in the book A Companion to Harry S. Truman. Uh, it was very useful in giving me an introduction to the debates you know, that uh, surround this election. So the first debate that my dissertation contributed to um, concerns the coalition of voters that was responsible for electing Truman. So one school of thought argues that Truman successfully mobilised the New Deal coalition that, that had been responsible for Franklin Roosevelt's election victories. So Samuel Lubel first uh, proposed this thesis in 1949 and he argued that Truman brought together a coalition of African Americans farmers, labourers, small business owners, um, northern liberals and Catholics. 
Um, however, there are other historians who have challenged this interpretation, and they argue that the New Deal coalition was not responsible for Truman's victory because it had started to fracture due to the issue of civil rights prompting many Southern Democrats to leave their party. Um, so the argument I make, uh, it supports the existence of a New Deal coalition, um, but I put more emphasis on African Americans than scholars uh, generally have. Um, then the second debate that my dissertation um, looks at is whether Truman's victory should be viewed as an upset. So many historians argue that the outcome should be seen as a surprise. Um, the first proponent of this argument was actually Truman himself, um, who argued in his memoirs that he won a personal triumph against considerable odds. Um, in contrast, um, other scholars believe that Truman led a very strong campaign, so uh, contemporaries were wrong to actually not have expected his victory. Um, my dissertation adds to this side of the debate by arguing that Truman's extensive support from uh, African Americans um, can be clearly observed, so his election victory was not surprising. Uh, and I'll just outline the argument that I made. Um, so yeah, as I said at the start, but simply my dissertation argues uh, that African Americans were highly influential in the outcome of the election because their support for Truman ensured his victory. Um, I made this argument in four parts, uh, with each part demonstrating that Truman appealed to African Americans while his opponents failed to do so. So, firstly, I demonstrated that Truman successfully appealed to African Americans, resulting in a majority of them um, voting for him. Um, before 1948 itself, Truman appealed to African Americans through supporting the establishment of a Permanent Fair Employment Practices Committee, um, which essentially addressed racial discrimination in uh, federal employment. Uh, Truman also appointed the President's Committee on Civil Rights, which was the first committee of, of its kind. Then after that, Truman addressed the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was the largest civil rights organization at the time. And then during 1948 itself, Truman um, solidified his support among African Americans through his uh, congressional uh, message on civil rights, um, during which he outlined a comprehensive civil rights program. Um, he also issued Executive Orders 9980 and 9981. Uh, these aim to address discrimination in uh, federal employment and also segregation in the American military. Um, the image you can see on this slide shows Truman signing Executive Order uh, 9981. Um, Truman also campaigned in the predominantly African American neighborhood of uh, Harlem, uh, which was quite unusual um, at the time. Um, uh, I then show that African Americans responded positively to Truman's support for civil rights, um, especially as he won 77% of their vote. Um, African Americans also ensured that Truman won uh, the states of California, um, Ohio, and also Illinois. Um, in these three states, the number of African American votes that Truman received greatly outnumbered his margin of victory. So this support ensured that he won these states. Um, a swing of just 30,000 votes in these states would have given the uh, Republicans an additional 78 um, electoral college votes, which would have uh, cost Truman uh, the election. Um, after that, um, I'll, um, I've shown that uh, Thomas Dewey, who was the uh, Republican candidate, um, who we've seen um, on this slide, uh, um, I'll show that he failed to appeal to African Americans during his campaign. Um, Dewey had actually acquired a rather strong civil rights record while he was governor of New York. Um, but he decided to uh, make little attempts to actually emphasise this record while he was campaigning. Um, this was because he was confident that he would win the election. And this sense of overconfidence um, primarily came from the Republicans' um, success in the 1946 midterm elections, uh, also Truman's low approval ratings, and both the newspapers and polls predicting a kind of landslide Dewey victory. Um, 
So this led to confusion among voters, um, as much of the electorate was actually unsure whether or not Dewey supported civil rights. Um, therefore, even though Dewey arguably had a stronger civil rights record than Truman, a majority of African Americans voted Democrat because Truman explicitly supported civil rights, while Dewey remained silent on the issue. Then after Dewey, um, I'll discuss how third parties influenced how African Americans voted. Um, so first, um, I uh, demonstrated that Henry Wallace, who left the Democratic Party to run for the uh, Progressive Party, um, I'll sh um, I showed that he was crucial in ensuring that African Americans voted for Truman. Um, Wallace actually had the potential uh, to win much support among African Americans because he was a strong supporter of civil rights. Um, you can see on this slide a uh, image of Wallace addressing an integrated crowd in uh, New Jersey. So um, African Americans were clearly interested in hearing him speak. Um, however, Wallace was supported by the uh, American Communist Party and he was um, sympathetic uh, towards the Soviet Union at a time when the American public desired a firmer stance to be taken towards the Soviets. Um, Wallace was tainted by this, so he lost much of his support. Um, therefore, many African Americans turned to the next most suitable candidate, which was Truman. Um, Truman therefore won the support of African Americans that would have voted for Wallace uh, were it not for the communist issue. Um, then finally, I've discussed um, Thurmond, who uh, defected from the Democratic Party to head the Dixiecrat ticket. Um, he can be seen on this slide uh, campaigning in Texas. Um, so I showed that um, Thurman's campaign essentially revolved around opposing Truman's civil rights policy. Um, this limited Thurman's support to Southern white voters while also convincing African Americans that Truman's commitment to civil rights was genuine. Um, with the extreme Southern wing of the Democratic Party gone, African, Ameri um, African Americans were therefore more inclined to vote for Truman. Um, Thurman did win four Southern states, but this was outweighed by the support that Truman received from African Americans in the North. Um, and I'll just discuss some of the primary sources that I used to actually um, make this argument. Um, I did use quite a few types of sources, but I'll highlight just a few now. Um, so I used contemporary newspapers to show public opinion towards the major candidates. Um, I also used opinion polls to determine what issues voters were most concerned with and why they voted the way that they did. Um, and I also used government documents uh, to explain the, uh, the uh, kind of campaign decisions that were made in 1948. And I'll just give a few more specific examples. Um, so I used an article called Truman Acts, which was published in the uh, Chicago Defender on February 14, 1948. So following Truman's message to Congress on civil rights, um, this African American newspaper called the message a uh, courageous attack upon racism in America and a uh, noble declaration of principles. Um, so this evidence shows African Americans responding positively to one of Truman's uh, civil rights actions. Um, then an opinion poll that I used um, was the 1948 uh, National Election Study, which was conducted by the National Opinion Research Centre. So one of the questions asked in this study was what people thought Dewey's stance on civil rights was. Uh, most people believe that Dewey was either indifferent to or that he actually opposed civil rights. Um, while fewer people accurately thought that he supported civil rights. Um, this shows that Dewey's choice to not mention civil rights genuinely resulted in voters not knowing his stance on this issue. Um, this most likely cost him uh, much African American support, uh, resulting in many of these voters choosing to support Truman. Um, then an example of a government document that I used um, was a uh, memorandum to Clark Clifford um, who was a senior advisor to Truman. Um, this was from uh, 19, uh, this was from February 1948. Um, so this source um, is from a uh, Democratic National Committee group uh, that was investigating how Truman could appeal to African Americans. Um, it was a response to Mississippi and also um, Alabama delegates exiting the uh, Democratic National Convention, uh, which you can see uh, on this slide. Um, 
following the adoption of a rather strong civil rights plank in the uh, democratic platform, which resulted in the establishment of the uh, Dixiecrat Party. Um, so the memo states that it takes a uh, considerable number of southern states to equal the importance of such states as New York, Pennsylvania, and Illinois. Um, so it's therefore arguing that Truman should appeal to African Americans because winning the North would outweigh any losses that would occur in the South. Uh, and I'll just quickly um, conclude. So essentially, my dissertation shows that African Americans were responsible for Truman's victory in 1948. Um, I have demonstrated this by making a four-part argument, um, with each part showing that all four of the major candidates contributed to convincing African Americans to vote for Truman. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, uh, when I showed you um, the image of Truman holding the uh, inaccurate um, Chicago Tribune headline, my dissertation um, it hopes to assist in understanding how this newspaper and uh, much of the rest of the United States um, came to be so certain uh, that Truman would lose the election. I'll take any questions if you want me. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've, I've got multiple questions. That's all right. Um, the first one. Um, to the extent of how, <coughs> how much was Truman's ability to appeal to the African American vote and therefore win the election dependent on him being the incumbent? In the sense of, you, you mentioned that a key plank of him appealing to the vote was his special address to Congress yeah. and signing two executive orders. You can only do that as an incumbent because you need the powers of president to do that. So, did that play an important role in, you know, would he have been able to appeal to the African American vote effectively, say if he was a, a challenger rather than the... No, you are absolutely right, yeah, like, as president, every action he does is noticed by everyone. And obviously, he could highlight all of his actions while president long before even he was campaigning. So yeah, he was at an advantage in already being president. But as I mentioned with Thomas Dewey, he also had a strong civil rights record and chose not to actually highlight that. So it's not just a case of doing a lot, it's also making it clear to the electorate what you've done. And Truman did both. He did a lot to impress African Americans and made it very clear that they knew that. So yeah, you're right, he was in a good position, but he used that to his full advantage. Okay. And then, um, second, just, just because like I said, you kind of lay it out, and if there's Gallup polls mm -hmm. telling us that there's support for civil rights, and the DNC knows that they can target the African American vote to win, and yet we're still seeing newspapers like that one, the Daily Tribune, yeah. the Daily. Do you think that comes down to the fact that 1940s America still disregarded and ignored? African American communities as having any kind of ability to influence American history? You think there was an inherent racism within the establishment that led to these kind of predictions that we now look back on now as being somewhat, you know, facetious and ridiculous? See, does that come from the fact that at the time they kind of had the blinders on when it came to acknowledging the potential power I of think so, African American yeah. vote? Especially as this was the first election in which African American voters generally had a big influence because for the first time many of them could vote. And I'd imagine lots of people underestimated how much of a sway these voters would have. And in subsequent elections, they were taken a lot more seriously. And you find both major party candidates then actively trying to appeal to this group. Uh, whereas in 1948, as you can see, people really did underestimate how influential these voters would be in, you know, certain key swing states. So yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of on topic, but sort of not. Um, it's my sort of understanding that the word African American was from Jesse Jackson in the 1980s, and you use some of these references from the 40s and sort of things like that. So how do they refer to the people then? They call them, you know, Black Americans or? African. <laughs> 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 the 
they would often call them words that you can't say anymore. So in the literature, they yeah, yeah, so, say that. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. Yeah, yeah. So like, I use plenty of quotes which use terminology that you wouldn't use now. Yeah. But when referring them in like your own words, yeah, no, you use the terminology that is currently used. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like, it's African American and then black is what's also used. But yeah, okay. there were plenty of other terms that were used in this period. So sometimes when you're going through the literature, okay, do you sometimes like feel that? You know, it's, it's almost, you can't believe that they like, write that as a, you know, educational document type thing. Yeah, because there are lots of terms they use that at the time they believed that was actually the nice thing to say. Mm -hmm. And they thought that by saying that they were actually being inclusive, whereas now it's obviously moved along a lot more. So yeah, I just use the terms that are currently acceptable, but it's possible they may change again. <laughs> <laughs> it gets cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we now have a talk by the president himself, Mr. Alan Stone. Mr. Truman. <laughs> 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 What's the question you want to ask? Yeah. 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 That's very nice. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, okay, I'm gonna answer the question of what if. What if? That is what we say. Sorry. Sorry. I can't hear what you're saying. What if? Um, so what if is a massive question. Mostly, I saw in the presentations today, you have asked what if questions. What if, in history, the elections go different ways? What if this happens? What if that happens? And we ask it in our day-to-day -day lives as well. We say, what if I didn't embarrass myself last night drinking? What if I didn't slide, Ale slide tackle Alex in the car? <laughs> um, yeah, so there's also, also, we always ask us uh, these questions, and we like to put them into movies and TV shows like the Marvel show What If, um, but throughout time this has been a major area where we haven't looked into, we have not studied much into it because it's a very difficult question. Um, so individually um, I could do something and I would observe it and then I could go back and say what if, however I cannot observe the other thing that happened, so if I took an aspirin, and then if I had a headache, I took an aspirin, and then I got cured by the, uh, or my headache goes away, I can't then go back and observe myself not having an aspirin. It's either one or the other. You only have one observation out of the two. So it's a hard, hard, fundamentally it's a hard question to ask, what if, because you've got so many confounding variables, things we don't know, we can't observe both of them, so we theoretically have to get the other outcome when it comes to it. So that's the question we're going to explore. Um, and my area of research is in stats and machine learning. Um, so everyone's very scared usually of the word machine learning. They hear it and it's like, what, this is really complicated by computers. People get paid loads of money to do it. But in reality, everybody does it every single day of their lives. Growing up, you are all machine learning experts. For example, the easiest way to explain how you've used machine learning in your lives. If a waiter would bring over a plate and it's hot, as a kid, you would touch the hot plate and realise then that it's hot. You saw the data now. You saw that if I touch this hot plate, it is then going to be hot. And it hurts, that's a negative outcome. You know then, you've got the data, and you probably would do it three or four more times if you forget, or you want to make sure the plate's hot every time, you'll then eventually stop touching the plate and realising that it's hot and you're going to burn yourself. So you are, you've all done this in your life. Um, and it usually takes a lot more data to make you realise something's good or bad. So you see a data again and again and again building up, and then eventually, in the future outcomes, you then modify your behaviour. This is what machines do. Machines also look at data again and again and again, same as ChatGPT, all for these AI kind of 
algorithms, they look at data again and again and again, and every time you pull it in, that's new data they look at, and that's how they come up with a future observation. Every time you put something in, something else comes out. Um, so we look at making algorithms that will kind of answer this question, where we get loads of data being put in continuously again and again and again. Um, and then the last thing I'm kind of, kind of discuss is why you shouldn't always listen to statistics if the person doing the statistics is crap at doing statistics or is biased or in a way where you can influence stuff on the world. Mostly the Tory party, but we won't say that they very much use statistics that are in a bad way. And, it's, uh, and the newspapers, they're also using statistics in a bad way that makes you see some cows, but there's so many paradoxes that uh, it, it, it's giving a different explanation for things. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's a bit bad that we have these newspapers that are not regulated against these. Only journals as well as reviewers and stuff like this. People can put down on paper whatever they believe. Show graphs on Facebook, on Instagram, and people look at it and they believe you. Okay, so um, what we're going to discuss first is something most of you probably saw before. Linear aggression. Um, so, what linear regression does, it would have an input, um, or many inputs, called the feature space, covariate space. So, we would say, for example, height would be an input, and then weight would be uh, an output. Um, and what we want to do is see if there's any link between uh, height and weight. And clearly looking at this graph, you can see that there probably is um, a link between both height and weight. Um, and if I said to you, judge it, and you've probably done this in science before, because they get you to do these kind of lines of best fit, uh, best fit you, could, you might put a line similar to this line here, or something very similar, and go, okay, we've done a line of best fit, this shows some sort of trend now, and if we wanted to do a new prediction, say, we take someone who's 150 centimetres of height, what is going to be their weight? What will be their weight? And only with this one piece of information, there's so many more different pieces of information, but if you're given this one piece, piece of information, you'd probably give a prediction about 55 to 60 kg or something like that. Uh, yeah, I made this graph, so don't look at the numbers too much. <laughs> it's not as that. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing. And what linear regression does, so linear means line. So we want to fit one line for this kind of whole data set. Um, but we might be able to get better um, results using different models. Um, and that's what we work to do. We want to use different models. But they become a lot more complicated. Uh, and it'll be hard to explain a lot of them in this short amount of time. So we're going to just stick with linear models. Um, and the, the, uh, linear, um, little, linear models are good because essentially this is a machine learning model and it's significantly used still in high companies like a lot of Netflix, Facebook, because the people who are doing them don't know what machine learning is. So they use models like this again and again and again and if, because managers don't know what they're talking about and the managers make these decisions. Um, so, for example, if we wanted uh, to fit this data, we could fit it slightly differently. What we could do instead, if I said I fit this data, say like this, this could be an option of me suggesting. You would now have to say A is the input and B is the output. 0 0.15 would be about 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. Yeah, so we can, we can fit this. But this is a bad model. Even though the observed data with what we see is perfect, there's, no, there's no, nothing wrong on the observed data. We've observed data, and every single time we observe that data, we say it's correct. We've joined them up in a way that it's perfect. Um, however, if we then get new, new points here, now we can see that the output is a lot further away from this line. So in a vertical line is the closest one to these outputs. And then if we go back to this line here, 
uh, so both from at the same time, you can see this linear uh, model here is much closer to um, all the points, these new points, than it is to this kind of um, one I've joined them all up together. This represents overfitting of the data. We need to add biased, we like biased, but then that's where some and, and kind of this kind of place where you can now decide statistics. It's, statistics isn't this is right or this is wrong. Every single model is wrong. To be like, yeah, this is unsubjective, we're gonna put it uh, the model in like this, it means it's gonna give a bad bad model out because eventually there's some error in all of these data. And linear models, linear yeah, linear regression is a really good model to predict this. Um, but we can we can take slightly different lines and all different kind of stuff. And but we, we can see that we, the more bias we got, the closer we get to, get to it. So we we like bias in a sense. So we don't hate on bias too much. Um, so here now we've got we can see that if we do this causal inference thing. So we say, what if we give someone a treatment, and what if we don't give someone a treatment? We, these people at the bottom have not been given a treatment, and these people at the top have been given a treatment. We can then model these two data sets, and if we model these two data sets with a linear transformation, what we can do is this. Here, we've done two different models on two different data sets. Clearly, they're apart. They're very much apart. And what we could, a, an idea of what we could say is how we can, how much has this treatment affected things? And a simple way of doing this, this is not necessarily right, but the, one way of doing this um, is simply by measuring the distance between these two linear linear lines. And this would call, be called the average treatment effect. And that is what we quantify on how much something has affected so, uh, something. Um, in general, we don't normally have just one covariate, so we call this covariate of feature space, and at the moment I've just got one in. Normally you would have a thousand, so the, but you can't, you can't visualise a thousand um, covariates on a graph, or you, you could go three dimensions, I suppose, or four dimensions, but after that it's impossible to do so. Um, that's why I'm only using one covariate to show that there's this treatment effect, this is what we're kind of, how much this one thing is affecting things. And that's a way we can do causal inference. However, with causal inference is the graphs sometimes come up with some bad things. So this graph shows a regression. So some sort of regression models filled through uh, over the years. And this graph shows that per capita, uh, per capita consumption of sour cream is related to motorcycle riders killed in mountainism transport accidents. And looking at this graph, they're very closely related, and it might seem that there's some correlation between these two. But there's clearly not. It's ridiculous um, to suggest that they are. And that's why you have to be very careful with this kind of things. And that is where you can kind of add your own bias in and uh, make sure you, if you don't have all the covariates in there, there'll be some sort of covariate that's meant that there's been an increase here and a smaller decrease there. And that's what you have to think about with statistics. And that's where you can kind of manipulate the statistics if you're a bad statistician, slightly. Okay. And then my final one is, a nice graph here. So here, what I've got, don't look at their numbers, or their numbers. Uh, so age of death here on the left. So that would be the output, the age of the person dying, and the treatment. Treatment here, OK? What, if you were all doctors, would you suggest um, giving that treatment to somebody? Yes or no? Raise your hand if yes. Uh, no one. No one. Because we don't understand what those numbers actually mean. No, the num forget the numbers. Forget the numbers. So treatment, the, so the higher treatment is to the right, age of death is higher. So the higher, the, higher this number, the higher age of death. 
and the higher the treatment, the more treatment given over this way. You wouldn't, you wouldn't give the treatment. I, I give so you're saying, treatment. it depends so, on the amount of treatment you're giving. Okay, yes, so yes. would you give them more treatment or not? No. No, no. Up to a more. <laughs> there. There's no difference here. Yeah, yeah, but this, I, this I is... I do it up to here and then stop. <laughs> I would say, like, it's actually past the dip, you like, like, that point there. So we fit a linear regression model, and clearly we see that if we have the treatment, so who would give the treatment? Would you have the treatment? Did you think that's giving the treatment? No, no. We've got half group now giving the treatment and half not. So who is giving the treatment? You're giving the treatment? Giving the treatment? Giving the treatment? Okay, okay, yes? Okay, so the people who did give the treatment is good. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't give the treatment because what the treatment is here is smoking. So the amount of people smoking here, this treatment, the more they smoke, the age of death is different. What? Hold on. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> hang on, hang on, what? <laughs> so this treatment down here is how many people smoke. The more they smoke, the age of death seems like it gets higher. But isn't that good? Don't you want to go off? So you mean to be able Yeah, yeah, no, so... <laughs> yes, yes, so... That one just seems initially, but that's what I'm saying. Statistics can be manipulated. Looking at this graph, if we have, like here, it goes up, and it's saying the more treatment we give, it looks like the longer people die. <laughs> the, long, the longer people live. <laughs> yeah, before, long, they die. Before, they, before, before they die. Before they die. <laughs> yeah, so the age of death is higher. <laughs> and then, if we look at this, two circles, this one is males, this one would be females, in a sense, and we can see that they both have, if you fit linear regressions on the two different groups separately, it's going the other way. And this is something called Simpson's Paradox, which affects things uh, massively. Okay. Huh? Simpson's Paradox? First yeah, Simpson's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's weird, it's my, my it's average. Three. <laughs> I can do our work and it's called the Bart algorithm as well, so <laughs> we got them all. Okay, and that's it. That's it. So you can spend four years on this? How, how did you get your data about people living and smoking? Well, that was my um, <laughs> how, so how, how, how did I get my data? data? Yeah, did you have a yeah, 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 smoke? What's your source? <laughs> um, yeah, what's your source? I used a pen and a piece of paper <laughs> and I decided what the data was going to be myself. <laughs> oh, so there's, there's no graphs in the world on smoking? No, I could so find you a graph. Yeah, yeah, hold on. So I have a question. If I want to kill someone, I tell them not to smoke. Yes. 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 That's if you don't know. That's if you don't know if they're male or female. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Cool. Uh, thank you very much for that talk, Adam. Next up, we have a very special speaker for everyone today. It's our guest speaker. This is Annabelle Palazzo. She has, currently has her own exhibition on offer at. Palace Library, which I suggest everyone goes see, and she's going to give us a little talk about it now. So, give her a call to Anna. Thank you, Olivia, and thank you for Adam to inviting me today as well. So, I'm going to talk to you all today about the exhibition that's here currently at the Museum of Archaeology at Durham University called Throwing It Out There The Archaeology of Rivers, Ritual, and Rubbish about finding the audience for that and how to cater to a museum audience. So, how it all started, if you think back to 2022 October, that is under, well, first week of uni, Annabelle there, um, about to embark on a nine month process on trying to make a museum exhibition. Picture the scene, it's your, one of your first lectures at uni, you're with 12 strangers you don't know, and all the staff come to you and say, is like, oh, we're gonna have to set up an exhibition. It has to be around ritual. Off you go. That's all that we got. So we as a group had to then cultivate 
had to make tech designs, had to do the marketing, had to pick out the objects for everything that we wanted to do. So, the research aims, I found myself trying to find the audience for this exhibition. And you're probably thinking, why is it important to find an audience for a museum exhibition? Under new museological um, practices, under Pete Vigo's book, museums are no longer about objects, they're about the people that visit them. That's how these institutions stay open. So, finding an audience is important. The audience we wanted to look at were children as well as families, and so to understand our art target audience and their needs, what they want to look at, what they found interesting, and also what objects they wanted to see, and also any interactives and things to keep them engaged in the space. Would they be interested in the topics that we were looking at? So we're looking at local histories of Durham, because we decided as a group from our titles, you can maybe see there on the far left there, um, throwing it out there was all about river archaeology in Durham. Any objects that have been thrown to the river, whether this was through ritual, accidental loss, or through pilgrimages. Then also, were the objects we picked engaging, which I'll show you in a few slides time, because uh, we looked at them through focus groups. And also, did people understand the term ritual? We find that ritual is a really big, complex word. Archaeologists usually dig something out and go, it's put there by ritual. Nothing more, nothing less. But to find out why these objects were thrown in, ritual is something that still we do today. So for example, it might be a ritual for you to go out and see the football on a Sunday. So, what was important to consider? The methodologies that we were using, because we wanted to look at children, so it's important to have an open dialogue with them, and also parents and surveys as well. Ethical approval, if anybody has done ethical approval through Durham University, you'll know that it is a pain in the bum. So we wanted to make sure that we got that rigorously done, also under the codes of consent, and also to make sure all the children that we were asking were okay with asking the questions. Open and close questions to make sure that you actually had enough data and aims to go off. Um, the best questions to ask to achieve our aims that we were looking at, like I said before, and also having enough time to collect the data. Because you need to collect the data and then also analyse it after. So, what methods were used? As I kind of previously said, focus groups to have open dialogues with the children that we wanted to. Um, we also wanted to make sure there's open dialogue so you could see what we wanted, wanted to do. Um, so, under there, as you can see, it's some of the objects we used. So, on the far left there is a cherub's head. I think it was thrown in from Durham pilgrims coming in for a good look and to make sure that they had um, a good pilgrimage. In the middle there is an intaglia ring from the Roman times. This was found in the River Tees by Pierce Bridge, which is just up from Durham. Um, Romans were very scared of water, so to make sure that they actually had safe crosses from where they were going over a bridge, they would really throw something in to let the gods know and thank them so they're safe crossing. And then also here we have a love token. It's kind of unsure what it's thrown in, but it's made from lead, it's medieval, um, but it's one of the maybe accidental losses that were found in the river. So we wanted to ask the children, did you like these objects? Did you find them engaging? Because these were some of the objects we were thinking about. Didn't like them, we wouldn't be put in the exhibition. Um, surveys for parents to do while they were going around the Museum of Archaeology to see what the kids liked while they were there, what they liked, um, because trying to do focus groups with parents is hard. Um, they don't really want to do it, people are busy. So we decided to do surveys while they were also going around the Museum of Archaeology while their kids were doing some of the trails. And also we did on the spot chats with the kids as well. So if they were in the space during this, um, Easter holidays, which was when all the data was collected, we could ask them questions there, what they enjoyed about their visits. And how the, the findings were shown. So for example here, one of the questions we asked was, would you like more or less of the following in this exhibition that we had spoken about? Um, so this was from one of the surveys we gave to some of the parents and we used stat graphs to see how popular things were. So for example here, most popular thing was walking trails and the least popular was kind of worksheets and also reading corner sorts of things. So then we knew what to implement in our exhibition. We also used other graphs like pie charts and that sort of thing to know like how many children parents would bring in, age demographic of these children, so on and so forth. Um, we also found word clouds were really useful to use as well to help showcase the data. Um, so here is one that we use all from our parent surveys on what does ritual mean to you? That was the question that was put to them. As you can see there, the purple letters are the words that came more repetitively. Uh, so I'll give you a quick look at that as well. Um, and also then we could understand that parents did kind of understand what ritual meant. Also from using these word clouds, we could also see like what interactives maybe they wanted more of as well. 
if we asked them the question, what did you like about this place? They would usually say certain things, certain artefacts that may have also been in the Museum of Archaeology at the time. So this is how our findings were implemented. Um, so, um, as I said before, we use word clouds. One thing that came back really popular of, from our word clouds of what do you like about this place is people saying costumes and dressing up. As you can see from this one, we hadn't even thought about costumes and dressing up. So it was a very quick scramble to try and get a dressing up corner and some costumes ordered, but that's what your audience wants, so you need to implement it. As you can see here from the panel design, I told the team timelines are really popular and also learning engagement staff members love a timeline. So here's a timeline of all of the, of the objects that we can find in the museum that we use in the exhibition. Also on this side here, uh, we have a text panel. This is our introduction of text panel. It was found that the kids didn't really understand ritual, as I previously said before. They just didn't get it. They didn't know what it was. So um, we had to make sure it was lined out clearly what a ritual was. Also, we kind of used from the Victoria and Albert Museum, they have a set phrasing of paddlers, swimmers and divers. We find this in yourselves when you go to a museum. Paddler is, you just want the bit of information and then you can move on. You just want to get the gist and you're done. Swimmer, you go a bit more deep into text, but you're not still reading it all. You're like, get a bit more of the information, then you leave. Divers, you're reading every text panel, every text that you can see, you're going beyond. So you're reading every object label and everything you can in the museum space. So how research leads to audience success. These are just a few of the things that people have said about us on TripAdvisor from the exhibition. So if they have come across and said, You've met our needs, it's what we wanted, and this is how it's done. So, um, that's all really that I'd have to say about that. That's where I was a bit of a whip through, but I know we're all a bit tired and went to drink some cider. So, <laughs> if anybody's got any questions, that's what I'm going to Hello. Hi. Um, <laughs> I have a question about like how you managed to find everything because you managed to find stuff from like a really long time ago. It's obviously going like like into like riverbeds. Like, how do you know like you're picking up actually something which is like actually something or like a random pebbles? So I will quickly show you. I think we've got a bit of time. So we had. I hate maps. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, we had. Um, diving teams that we had that would already given their objects to Durham University Collections. So one team was um, a metal collecting duo, father and son, um, and they searched the River Greta. River Greta's not a thing anymore, it's just boggy marshland, because it used to be where the river we were used to flow, but meandering doesn't meander there anymore. So we have them. We also have Bob Middlelass, who is um, a dad for the River Tees. He used to dive with his friend Rolf, but Rolf sadly passed away a few years ago. But there's still collections from that as well that they found in the River Tees. That's mainly Roman and Saxon. Then the River Weir, objects still up to the very present day. I think the most recent objects that are dive at Gary Bankhead dove is literally a blackberry bold. So there's still stuff being found and still being catalogued as if it's a historical object, even though we wouldn't think a Blackberry Bowl phone <laughs> right. is a historical object, but it's still being catalogued. A lot of his stuff, he's found over now 15,000 objects. Um, Bob found about 5,000, I think. And then um, the network collecting duo only found 3,000. Of course, the older it gets, the less likely it to survive, more materials move on. Obviously, Middle Ages, we're using lead and materials that won't perish as much in rivers. So if I just quickly sh show you... Do you want to keep that? Yari. Oh. I think this should work well. Or is he just talking the whole way through? Oh, sorry, he's talking through that. Excuse me, Yari. There you go. Thank you. Gary has a I'm YouTube channel. And they're finding stuff like that, just in the river. Use his hands. Yeah, literally. He just like worms his way through, manages to find everything. I don't know why he's paddleboard in there. Apologies, guys. I should have probably that repair bit better. Um, but he can literally. Oh, here we go. 
This is literally him under the water. This That's is just fun. in the river where. That was probably the issue. Yeah. What? There's yeah. literally That's a serious time with you again. Is he like just a local person? Yeah. He's, he's going swimming in the river? Yeah. He literally just goes in the river where, so it's by the SU. Um, literally by where Jimmy's is, that's where he's diving. So literally... Oh, that's going to be all sorts of now. Yeah. <laughs> a spoon, it seems. The skull comes out. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, it's just tiny things like that. So that's wow. like a pin. Okay, the spoon. Does he also take out litter and stuff? And like, does he do that just, just one archaeology oh, stuff? Um, it does take out the, <laughs> that <laughs> archaeology stuff because it's very <laughs> so deep <laughs> in the <laughs> land. It could yeah. be seen as litter, so that's why in the title it's rubbish, because it's somebody's rubbish, so it's somebody's treasure. So for example, a spoon. No, I mean like, does he also go, because there's like all sorts of crap in the way, like does he also do from like an environmental, like, remove facts, like plastic facts that are in the river and all that stuff? Um, finds not it, not particularly that I know of, but it's still that, there's still so much stuff in the layers of the river, so it's still like getting rid of that, incorporating that, and then giving it to DU. Because now, recently, all of Gary's finds have been given to Durham University, but now there's 15,000 artifacts in the catalogue, they've only got through one seventh, maybe, <laughs> if that. That's and he's right. still finding more now, so he's still bringing them stuff. So it's just constant. <laughs> Hello. Um, how can you tell like, what the stuff actually is like? I know you said like like it's a love token, but like how how certain can you be? And like you said cherub's head, but that did not look like a cherub's head. <laughs> it's just from like research. So like people do write cases about it, artifact reports are a big thing. So like there was also, like as you say as well, there's an artifact that Gary found of like kind of a plaque and he thinks it's Mary riding a donkey. Other people may think that's just Jesus as a baby, Mary is holding Jesus the baby. But then we saw it and was like, that's George and the Dragon. <laughs> so <laughs> there's loads of different interpretations. It's just about researching and finding out because there will be similar objects out there. It's just finding them. So like I did an artifact retort on like weights that were found by Gary as well. Um, but I had to use like some that may have been found in like London Thames. So there are other artifacts out there. It's not usually just one artifact. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> can I, can I ask a very meta question? Yeah? Um, to what extent is your word related to like the commercialization of museums and the public space? In the sense of like, you know, to me you're talking a lot about how do we sell museums, how do we sell exhibitions to people, mm. looking at different environments and stuff. So that makes a question for me. Has, has this come about because museums have become commercialised, that they have to compete in almost like as a business would? It is difficult because a museum is a non profit industry. So a museum actually can't technically make profit. So it is just catering to an audience. So then maybe you can go and say, I'm catering to my audiences, I am getting visitors in, and that's usually so then you can get accredited. So that's a thing where basically you fill out forms, get accredited, and then you're a higher museum status, or you can go and get heritage funds. Because if you if people are interested in your museum, then people will come, and then you can get heritage funds, so then you can develop your museum more. So it's just basically showing that there is interest mm. in what you have to offer. So. <laughs> <laughs> What's the oldest objects that you found? Oh! Because but that's I found. Do you want to give that to a present? Yeah. Oldest objects I found. Yeah, you personally. How many times have you found a bit of a picked up object? Um, I think the oldest objects that we had really were from like the Roman periods. So like this Intaglia ring, for example. Thank you, Olivia. Um, would be a pretty old one, but we did have a lot of old Roman stuff. We also found. Um, there's a leather shoe that's also on display because Romans found it lucky to help good river crossings if they like threw in the left shoe. Mm. So there's a loads of left shoes in the river, but not many of them survive because obviously they're made of leather and that's an organic material. 
So probably them as well. Just mostly Roman stuff. Are no, they all walking around with one shoe on? That's what I was thinking. I guess so, or maybe the shoe was broken. Like, yeah. yeah just take it for Surely it wouldn't be a very nice roller crossing. Oh, you have like one dry well, shoe. Well, usually they'll be going over a bridge. Ah. But they were that superstitious and like, the Verums were really superstitious and they just had no trust with water because obviously so many gods they had, they were like, water's bad. Don't do it. <laughs> so, Don't drink water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so you showed us a couple of good reviews. Can you show us a couple of the bad reviews? <laughs> <laughs> There's no bad reviews. It's not my exhibition, personally. Yeah. Um, but other than that, some fun. Well, yeah, I think it is hard to cater to an audience, especially when you're a World Heritage site. You are going to have people just saying stupid things like, "There's no cafe." There is no cafe in the Museum of Archaeology, and museum visitors love a cafe. Um, <laughs> so it's just kind of like little things like that, but it is obviously trying to improve your audience, make it better. So TripAdvisor is one of the most important ways museums can help get audience feedback. Olivia, hi. Yeah, um, you said that nowadays when you're making like a museum exhibit, like the importance of like um, like thinking about the audience and like more focus on that. Um, as a result of that, would you say there's greater importance in how you market and promote it to like get it out there? Yeah, definitely. Um, like, so I've just been doing the Museum of Oxford Placement, sort of may know, and most of my stuff has been putting listings of events on things. And I've done like over, like within two weeks, I've done 25 events on five different platforms. So it's just like that importance of getting the word out there, especially when you're like a smaller museum and maybe harder to find. So it's about getting that word out there and marketing yourself and looking good on Instagram, Facebook. So it's all good. <laughs> Two people there, thank them. Oh, thanks for watching the paper. <laughs> oh, <laughs> joining. Okay, um, yeah, we're gonna have a drinks reception at half eight. So if it'll give you some time to go and have some food. If anyone wants any more cheese or, uh, or squash or donuts or grapes or celery. Um, <laughs> so, um, before we go, uh, Olivia might want to say something, but everyone. Um, yeah, thank you guys everyone for turning up and for everyone for speaking. I think it went quite well. Sorry it went a little bit longer than it was meant to. Just but I think bit. it just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it turned out well though. Um, maybe you can tell Katie and she'll put one off the next year, but we'll see. We'll have to uh, go to a seminar style event. Sorry, yes. <laughs> thank you for coming to the seminar style event. Um, yeah, so thanks to you guys as well. So well done to everyone.